Uh oh. And then, do you have an abstract two course on your uh -huh. page? I might do that too. Actually, I might redo your abstract one and then go in your abstract two. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. I think my abstract one, it will be, it should be pretty easy going for you since you've had, yeah. you know. No, but you're probably going to go a little bit more into some stuff than that's more. So we, we have this differential operator. Okay. And x on eta. It gives us zero. So here, I'm thinking b is d, uh, d zeta. Mm -hmm. And um, we're looking for eta, which is a function from, let's say, you know, the uh, algebra to the algebra. And um, a n, a n minus one, a one, a zero. These are all elements of the algebra. Yeah, these are the coefficients. Okay. So the, the coefficients of the differential equation are <laughs> given by the yeah, by these constants. And um, it turns out that, so in the usual case, um, you just say, okay, well, you know, we're going to assume for this to be an nth order problem that, um, you know, a sub n has to be non-zero, right? Mm. So that, that's the usual real or complex differential equation story. You don't even, I mean, what else are you going to have? Well, you're going to have a n equal to zero, right? Non-zero or zero. And if it's zero, well, then you can just collapse back down to what's the first thing that's non-zero, and it becomes that defines the order of the differential equation, right? But here, um, the story is a little bit more nuanced, right? Because a sub n could be one of three things. It could be... Possible stories uh, related to um, <clears throat> not going to the potty in a timely fashion. Um, but anyway, so the leading coefficient can either be zero, a unit, or a zero divisor. Mm -hmm. So of course, if it's if it's zero, then like fine, whatever. But uh, it turns out, so we're going to say that if um, a sub n is a unit, then you know, this equation up here, give a name, then star, is a non-degenerate nth order AOD. On the other hand, if AN was a zero divisor, a non-zero zero divisor, then it would be what I would call a degenerate AOD. Um, in section 5 here, what we're looking at, I basically explain that the solution to non-degenerate AODEs is very, I think we understand it pretty well. Um, and I have some examples also in the next section, section 6 if I recall correctly, of degenerate AODEs where you just, you, you, I mean, I, I think I have less sweeping understanding of those. I can just tell you that weird stuff happens. Um, usual existence and uniqueness theorems fall in degenerate AODs because zero divisors are troublemakers. Now, so I say our discussion is divided into three main story arcs. First, I describe how to solve a constant coefficient AOD by an operator factorization in the ring AB, um, where D is D D zeta, and then second, I'll study how isomorphism of algebras allow elegant solutions where the given algebra is known to be isomorphic to a direct product. 
And then third, I introduce, we introduce a model generalization of the complexification technique. In particular, we show how the exponential, um, the natural expansion algebra produces the fundamental solution set. Um, and I should emphasize from the outset that the theorems we looked at last time, um, theorem 3.10 and 3.11, show us that the general solution exists. Yeah. Right, we're simply providing right. methods of calculation which reveal the explicit structure of that general solution. Mm -hmm. um, before we go on, I remember I had a question. Uh, during my conference, they were talking about something called a semi-direct sum. Mm -hmm. and it made me question my understanding of how direct sum works. Could you go over that before? Because I remember, remember when we said that H3 was the direct sum of R yeah, so, to R, right? So, semi-direct sum... And I wanted to make sure my understanding of how it works. For semi-direct product, it's... it's uh, we'll start with direct product before, and then we can... Uh, I want to make sure my definition of direct product is correct. Well... So how do you define the direct product? Well, direct product... Or direct sum, I mean, I'm sorry. Direct sum. Like how um, we have like the hyperbolic space and stuff. So, okay, there's, there's really kind of two things that are going on. Okay. If you have U and W subsets of V such that U plus W is equal to V, and u intersect of u is just containing zero. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I do mean to say that they're actually subspaces of v, okay? Okay. Then we say u direct sum w is equal to v. Now, Technically speaking, this is an internal direct sum. The reason it's an internal direct sum is that um, these are actually subsets of V, mm -hmm. right? In contrast, um, if I had like vector space V1, and um, vector space V2, I can talk about the external direct sum of one V2 like this. And that's just the set of ordered pairs, X1, X2, such that X1 is in V1, X2 is in V2, like that. Now, so like, um, my claim is that this is a vector space with respect to the usual uh, vector space structure in a Cartesian product. So like C times X1, X2, what is it? It's CX1, CX2, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you add vectors, pairs of vectors? You add them component-wise, right? Like X, X1, X2 plus Y1, Y2, how's it work? It's X1, Y1. Mm-hmm. Or plus one one and x two plus one two. So this defines scalar multiplication. This defines vector addition. You can prove that this set v one direct sum v two, all right, is a vector space with respect to the same field of scalars as shared by v one and v two. And it's a new vector space. It's neither v one. It's not v two. Right. It's pairs of things. Right. And so. You say at this point you should be like, well, but, 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 but you're using. How can you do this and also do this at the same time? Aren't those notations like at odds with one another? Well, yeah. Wait. So how are you defining v one and v two here? Because aren't, aren't they like that's, that's a subspace? But aren't those just too random? Like to any V1 and V2 or just any? Well, yeah, I mean, I could, I could put U and W here. Yeah, so there's any random space. But the point is they don't have to be subsets of another vector space. Okay. But it's just such that um, you get a direct sum when you, when you get, when you add them together, you get a space. And then if you take the intersect of it, you get zero or, or is right. that an empty set? Yeah. 
So in here, um, in this one, right, the set of like zero Cartesian product V2 is, what is that? That's things of the form zero comma x2, mm -hmm. such that x2 is in V2, right? I mean, that's just x2 again, really, isn't it? Is it though? And here, V1, Cartesian product zero, is things of the form. Mm -hmm. So it is true that v1 direct sum v2 is actually equal to zero Cartesian product v2 v2. Uh, v2. Sorry, let me do it the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, v1 Cartesian product with zero plus zero Cartesian product V2, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at it, you can take anything in here and you can express it as a sum of something like, see, the fact yeah. that this is equal to that is because you can add this plus that and you get x1, x2. And also the intersection of these guys, right? It's the set just containing zero, zero. Yes. So that means that V1 cross zero and zero cross V2, these are what are called independent subsets. These are independent subsets of V1 Cartesian product V2. So you can just write V1 cross V2 in the usual set theory, right? So like as a point set, notice that v1 direct sum v2 is really just v1 cross v2. They're ordered pairs of things from v1 and v2. So why do so what's the why do we have to label it as a direct sum instead of a Cartesian product? Um, you know these are identifications that are made. That you could just I mean, that, that's one way I do it when I teach it, because that's unambiguous. It's a direct, direct product of V1 and V2. Um, but here's the thing. The, basically, the theorem is this, is that if this is the tie that binds, you know, if you have U and V, U and, U and W, right, subspaces of V, such that V is equal to U direct sum W, then V is isomorphic to the Cartesian product of U and W. In particular, the isomorphism is this. Psi of, let's say, X comma Y is equal to X plus Y um, for X, Y. In uh, uh, U cross W. So this is this is the interchange. Um, but really, okay. So I mean, this is the correspondence x comma y or x plus y, right? So like, I, the reason I use the direct sum notation is I want to, on one hand, I want to think about a comma b, right? Mm -hmm. But I also might want to think about that as a plus bi, right? Yeah. So uh, if I want to get that idea across, I say, well, c is our direct sum ir. So this comes with the idea, and I, so this is, you know, it's also my custom to just not write the number one, but you know, you can think about it being there, right? So th this has in it implicitly the idea that one and I are linearly independent because they're 
they're from separate subspaces. Mm -hmm. See, this is communicating the idea that R and IR are independent subspaces of this complex number system. So, like, in the same way, if my algebra is, say, R plus V1, V2, rather, R, V3, R, you know, that's just kind of like, well, for me, that's a, a fast way to communicate that 1, V2, and V3 are linearly independent. In some sense, it's really just a way for me to write a basis for the space at the same time writing the space. So it, it's, it, it does kind of have all that. But this is the fundamental like thing you go back and forth with, is internal direct sum is when the sets are subsets that are independent, meaning that they add together, that, that their intersection is zero and they add together the whole space. Whereas the external direct sum is actually just the Cartesian product. And the theorem is that if you have one or the other, there's an isomorphism. And the isomorphism is just pairs go to like pairs go to addition. And the fact the fact that it's an internal direct sum means that there exists a unique x and y, such that any vector in V can be written as that unique linear combination of x and y. So the inverse is, is well defined. Now when you have more than but this can be generalized to n. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to have just two sets. You can talk about and I've already talked about three there, right? Yeah. But you can have finitely many um, things form a direct sum. When you talk about independence of like n subsets, pairwise intersection is not enough. You have to have that the intersection of the subset with the sum of the remaining subsets. Oh, zero. so like the R intersect the direct product of V2R plus the direct product of V3R. Yeah, um, let's, so, right, right, yeah, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, let's see here, so if I had, yeah, just to be more specific here, if I had um, V1 direct sum, V2 direct sum, V3 equals to V, and suppose I'm talking about an internal direct sum, right? Mm -hmm. um, what I would need then is for, the condition for independence here is that V1 intersect V2 plus V3 is just zero. Um, v2 intersect v1 plus v3 is 0, and v3 intersect v1 plus v2 also has to be 0. You need all of these three independence conditions for those to be independent subsets. And you also, of course, need that the sum of the three spaces is the whole space. These are the four conditions you need for that to be an internal direct sum of v1, v2, and v3, given, of course, that v1, v2, and v3 are subsets, excuse me, subspaces mm -hmm. of v being a vector space. The, the, um, an example where you get, I mean, here's, here's the, you'd be like, well, why is it pairwise independence? Why doesn't that work for three? So an easy example of how that breaks down is just take the plane and take three lines to the origin. So this line, so maybe P, that's V1R, right? Take another line over here, V2R. Oh, yeah, one of them has to be the other one. If you're not, they're not linear independent. V3R. I'm, I'm supposing here that V1, let's, let's just say V1, V2, V3 are in linearly independent set of vectors, yeah? Okay. That's not possible. Yeah. But <laughs> no, but you can easily show that they're not. These are distinct factors. Yeah. Okay, distinct. Uh, and I, I and I don't want any two of them to be multiple of another. Okay. Yeah. But the the, the point is, they're independent. Mm -hmm. The intersection of any of these, just the origin, right? Yeah. And if you add these together, you get all of R two. Mm -hmm. But R two is certainly not the you know, it is not. The direct sum of, um, you know, no, yeah, you you vastly you fall short. The, well, the trouble is that these the the intersection, the pairwise intersection of these spaces being zero, does not give you 
independence of the subspaces. No, because well, how I see it is that like, um, like V one and V three cannot be linear independent because V one you can it right. stay multiple essentially. So if yes, if V one and V three are not linearly independent, if they are linearly yeah. independent, that means that we add them together, we get the whole space because. Yeah. Two linearly independent vectors generates all of our two. Yeah, right? but B three, I, I think about it just like equation wise. So you get y equals m x on both of them because you know the origin zero. Therefore, B one and B three are just a scalar multiple of each other because m can be converted to B B one or B three. That makes sense. No, I'm not. I I I, I I'm not. Um, I just did it algebraically. I mean, there's there's no flexibility. These are given lines. Uh huh. You can't convert one to the other. And I want to assume that they're distinct lines. Yeah, but if you added V1 and V3 and V2, you what, what does that mean space. to add what does it mean to add one and V3? Like what is V what is V1? Let's talk about that. V V1R plus V3R. What does that mean? That would mean um, like some constant S times V1 plus some constant T times V3. Mm -hmm. Such that S and T are, are real numbers, right? Yeah. But if, if V1 and V3 are linearly independent, you have two vectors in R2. Yeah, you get R, all of R2. All of R2. Right, so what's the intersection? So see, see this, if I take V2R, mm -hmm. and I intersect it with the sum of V1R. It should be R. zero, right? Or no. But it should be zero. It should be zero, but what is it? Oh, it's, <coughs> it's still R squared. Well, yeah, this is R2, so what's the intersection of any set, subset of R2 with R2? There is no intersection. Or there, all, everything's intersecting. Right, yeah. It's right. the same set. Sorry. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's just the whole stupid line again. So these are not independent subspaces. No. This is because this is how we define independent yeah. subspaces. But they are pairwise. They pairwise intersect to zero. Mm -hmm. But that's not. That's not what we need. And of course, see this. If these are distinct, mm -hmm. um, see this, this. This can't be. Yeah. If it was. It would be isomorphic to the Cartesian product of like the Cartesian product of V1R, V2R, V3R. Yeah, um, that, R. that is isomorphic to R3. Yeah. Which makes sense. But that makes sense in the context that you're not exercising the linear dependence that is has to be present between V1 and V2 and V3. There is a linear dependence here because we have three vectors in R2. Yeah. So, you know, the external direct sum is a useful construction if I want to express something as a linear combination of things that have a linear dependence, which I'm not going to use. <laughs> That's one way to think about it. So they would be linear independent in R3. The, well, yes. Well, what I'm saying is <clears throat> V1R direct sum, V2R direct sum, V3R, right? This is <clears throat> basically equal to, I mean, I, I actually have no choice here but to say this is equal to the external direct sum because the internal direct sum is not an internal direct sum. It's like I, I can't even use this notation. It is not deserve because these are not independent subspaces. I, I, I kind of have to interpret it this way, if you think about it. And what, what that is, is triples, right? It's triples of the form S times V1, T times V2, R times V3, right? Mm -hmm. Such that um, R, S, T are real numbers. And so, like, up to isomorphism, that is R3. The isomorphism is to send this triple to just any S triple. Just, just to STR, just to yeah. throw away the... But, like, the direct interpretation of this is it is a particular subset of... I would say it's a particular subset of R6. Because that's a two-dimension vector, that's a two-vector, that's a two-vector, that's a two-vector. If I string three two-vectors together, I've got a six-vector. So, like, 
this is some kind of weird subset of R6, which is isomorphic to R3. And of course, I do have room for three linearly independent vectors in R6. I know it can be confusing. So are we saying ST and B or ST and R are also? Those are just real numbers, right? Yeah, real numbers. So, so where are you getting the two pairs of? Is that where you're getting the two pairs of vectors? Two pairs. Of vectors. It's because these are. I'm assuming that uh, v1, v2, and v3 are vectors in the plane. Mm -hmm. So they're by assumption two vectors. Oh yeah. Okay. That's all. So um, I don't think your differential equations class covered operator factorizations very deeply. No, we just use it to like. Uh, this. Actually, uh, good thing I brought my notebook. Huh? Uh, you, you 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 likely did it to solve systems yes. with differential equations. That's, that's what we did. I like chapter five. Um, Let me give you a, a quick crash course in what's called the method of annihilators. Okay. All right. So this is, I want to say section 6.5 in your text maybe. Nagel Staffensteiner. But it's definitely in chapter 6. So, mm -hmm. all right. so, first of all, the essential observation is that if we have polynomials of operators, they satisfy the usual laws of polynomial factorization. In other words, if I've got like d squared plus 3d plus 2, mm -hmm. I can factor that yeah. as d plus 1 times d plus 2. Now, technically speaking, that is a statement about operators, right? So you let it act on functions on both sides, and you show that they're equal for any choice of function. That's what's meant here. It's, and what, what actually is meant here, to be like more pedantic about it for just a second, d squared plus 3d plus 2 acting on a function, how does that work? What's that mean? It means you take d of df, right? Like, square means successive operation of the operator on the function, it's composition of function operators. Yeah. This is th three times the derivative operator acting on the function, and then this is plus twice, just two times the function, right? Mm -hmm. So you take the sum of these three functions, that's what defines this differential operator acting on that function. I feel like I remember us doing it as like the DDF thing the first time, mm -hmm. as, as d squared f over d or whatever. Or, that, right. Or like d squared over df, right? Oh yeah, if we expand it in the differential yeah. notation, that would be d squared f dx squared, or yeah. d squared f dt squared. Yeah. yeah. Now this in contrast, if we have d plus 1 times d plus 2 acting on f, what's that mean? Well that means d plus 1 operator acting on the d plus 2 operator acting on f, right? Mm -hmm. Which specifically means d plus 1 operator, d plus 2, well that's df. f plus 2f. 2f. And then that's d acting on df, acting on 2f, plus 1 times the operator, times the function df plus 2f, which then is d on df plus d on 2f plus df yep. plus 2f. Which then, because the d and the 2 operator commute, you get 2d plus d, which is 3d, and you get d squared plus 3d mm -hmm. plus 2 acting on f. All right, great. So there's, there's the proof yep. that these are the same operator. But ultimately, it boils down to this, the multiplication by a constant operator and the differentiation operator commute. Yeah. That's what drives. But I mean, I'll make, uh, you can prove that for you know, uh, anything, any function. 
Right, and that's still true for differential operators. Yeah, because you can, you can pull out, like every time you're taking a derivative, you can always pull out a constant, mm -hmm. and the, the differentiation will still be the same. Right. Now, this is not true if we look at polynomials and other operators. Um, generally, if you, if you look at like a polynomial, if you look at a polynomial in the operator t, mm -hmm. you know, or t is some other operator, it doesn't have to obey the same kind of factorization because, in general speaking, there's no reason that t squared acting on f has to be the same as. Oh, shit. Oh, excuse me. I should just say the differentiator. Well, I don't know how to say this. Um, Actually, let me not say that at the moment. Let me let me stick with the pointer right here. Let me not get into the, the weeds. Yes, we'll get back to the weeds in due time. That's the question. Or there's a section on the question or the problem at the end of the paper. We'll get back to that. Okay. So um, great. We can we can factor now. How does this help us solve differential equations? Well, it helps us solve differential equations. You see, because if I have d plus one acting on y. And let's, let's suppose here that d is ddt, just for the sake of discussion, okay? Okay. Then that has solution y is equal to c1 e to the minus t, right? And d plus 2 acting on y, well that has solution c2 e to the minus 2t, right? Mm -hmm. So if I have d squared plus 3d plus 2, and if I have d plus 1, d plus 2 acting on y, well, I know that both this and that are separately solutions because I can, you know, if, if d plus 2 hits, if this is, you know, c2 e to the minus 2t, then this d plus 2, this d plus 2 hits that function is 0. Yeah. And then this is 0, this hit 0 fed into, into a differential operator, 0 again. This is, by the way, a linear operator, among other things. It's a, a smooth operator, actually. Um, so when it gets into there, I get zero, right? But on the flip side, you could just as well write this as d2 times d1 acting on y equal to zero. See, so because when you factor a polynomial, you can commute the factors. Right? So this formula, d2 plus d, d2 acting on d1 plus y, that naturally you can see that c1 e to the minus t is zero because you feed that into there and you get zero. Right? Mm -hmm. So the fact that the factors commute and the fact that you can like find this, what makes each factor separately go to zero means that you can take the second order problem and chop it into two first order problems. I think that's what we did. Right. Most likely. Now, of course, we can, um, you, you know, you can, you, can, you can circumvent this whole discussion by just plugging in the, um, if you have a polynomial in the, in the D operator, and you plug in E to the lambda T, right? Mm -hmm. You end up with P of lambda, E to the lambda T, because when, when you differentiate the lambda, you bring down as many powers as the derivative, you keep the coefficients the same, so you end up with P of lambda E to lambda T, and then if you set this equal to zero, well, since this is non-zero, it forces that to be zero, hence the characteristic equation, right? Completely avoided the operator of factorization idea. This is how we typically teach it in calculus too. Mm -hmm. We're going to teach this stuff. Like you might at like a state school, which has engineering. Okay, so. All right. This is factorization. Um, let me show you some more. If we have d squared plus 4d plus 1, let's say, um, plus 5, one of my favorites. So then this is d plus 1 squared, 2 squared rather, plus 1. This is irreducible, mm -hmm. but this one, um, of course you could, you could factor it over the complex numbers if you like, d plus 2 um, minus i, d plus 2 plus i, to like e to the 2 minus t to the minus 2 minus i t 
and e to the minus 2 plus iit. These would be your separate solutions for each one of these factors. And like if you look at it, that's e to the minus 2t. Uh, plus or minus. Yeah. And then that gives me plus, so I get a cosine t plus i sine t. And this one gives me e to the minus 2t cosine t minus i sine t. And when you look at these, actually, um, I mean, these are distinct roots, but the, um, the real part and the imaginary part here are linearly, like the real parts of these are equal, mm -hmm. and the imaginary parts are off by minus. So if you take either one of these, you've got the full deal. Because you, you can prove that if we have a real differential equation, right? If, you're, if your differential equation is like L of y equals to zero, right? Yeah. This, and suppose that y is a real value solution. If you look at the complexification of that problem, namely that you look for solutions like this. So, I mean, it's a little bit slippery here, but basically y is a function from r to r. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we're allowing z to be a function from r to c. So this would be the complexification of the problem. You're looking for possibly complex value solutions to the differential equation but you're keeping the rule for the differential equation the same. So like the differential equation has real coefficients, right? Like this one has real coefficients, but this solution right here, see this? Is this a real function from R to R? No, no. it's a function from R to C. Yeah. So this is a solution not to the original differential equation, which would have been, you know, y prime prime plus four y prime plus five y equals to zero. This is a real differential equation, it's got real coefficients. So is there, you know, is, is E, uh, in this case, E to the minus 2t cosine t and E to the minus 2t sine t, these are separate real solutions, right? But either one of these things I've written is a complex solution, right, to this given differential equation. So these are, these are not solutions to the original real differential equation. These guys, are solutions to the complexification of this differential equation. Yeah. Which technically is a different differential equation because you change the rules of the game. You're looking yeah. for possibly complex value solutions. Right? But they are closely related. And the main theorem is that if you have a solution to the complexified differential equation, right, then both the real and imaginary parts of the complexified solution are separately solutions to the original differential equation. So let me prove that for you. So, but why would you need to do this instead of um, doing the characteristic equation with complex roots? That doesn't explain why sine and cosine are solutions. You just said that they were and checked that they were. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's an explanation, it's not a derivation. So this is part of a more general pattern. Yeah. If we have L of z equals to zero, where z is equal to, let's say, um, z1 plus i z2, right? So this is a function from the reals to the complexes, right? Where z1 and z2 are both separately functions. They're both real value functions of a real variable. So I'm assuming here that suppose, suppose L is a um, a real differential operator. Then, <clears throat> if L of z equals to zero, <laughs> and so you're like. So this, they just tell us this then, like for the characteristic equations? Yes. They're just like, hey, this should work. It's a natural assumption. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's sneaky. Mm -hmm. um, well, she, she said e to the lambda t, right? And she showed you that. Alpha t. 
and they do. Right, she says that, well, if lambda has to solve the characteristic equation, and if the characteristic value is complex, then you get e to the alpha plus i beta t, which is e to the alpha t is cosine of beta t plus i sine beta t. Right, but like, we didn't get an i. separate real solutions. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm, I'm explaining to you that those both descend as the real and imaginary parts of a complex solution. She's not even talking about the complex solution. Okay. Although she probably was like this is the thing. <laughs> when you talk about e to the lambda t and you plug it in, yeah. it doesn't jump out at you guys and go, hey that's a complex solution, but it is when lambda is complex. Like, your class probably was doing the same, but not advertising. Um, I, I don't know anybody who teaches differential equations who goes, all right, let's complexify the problem, and that means that lambda could be complex. No, what we do is we say, let, let y equal e to the lambda t. Let's plug it in and see what happens. Oh, lambda happens to be complex. What's that mean? <laughs> you know, like, but if, you, if you're really picky about it, we have replaced the given problem, which is a real differential equation, equation. with a corresponding complexified differential equation. It's not the same equation that we're solving. We're solving for a complex value function real variable. The question is, how is the complexified version related to the original problem? So, you, you, so we're basically going to start backtracking here? Yeah, I'm going to show you that if, we have L, if this is the complexified... And so like, the question is, what does this even mean? Yeah. And so here's the definition. Um, I mean, how do we differentiate with respect to x, uh, with, with respect to t, a function of t plus i times a function of t? What, what's the definition? Well, the definition is that you differentiate the real part, and you differentiate the imaginary part. You just do it like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that amounts to here is that L of z, so if you have L of like z1 plus i z2, that um, by definition essentially is L of z1 plus i L of z2. And I guess you could make that the definition, you could show that that propagates up from like the diff diff derivative level definition um, because this, the, the, the smooth operator is like, I'm thinking of it as a constant co- I'm thinking of it an operator. I'm thinking of this as an operator of the form like I have over here, you know? Mm -hmm. But the truth is there's a more general theorem to be found here. But if, anyway, if L of Z1, let's just say it this way, if L of Z1 plus I Z2 is L of Z1 plus I L of Z2, right? And, and if that's equal to zero, That uh, means, oh, it's the same thing, it's just a, it's going to be a differential equation. Well, the thing is, L of z1 and L of z2 are functions from r to r. Mm -hmm. Because I'm assuming that z1 and z2 are real functions, real value functions of real variable. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming L is a real smooth operator. Real smooth operators take real functions to real functions. Yeah. So that means this is real, this is real. So we have the, a real thing plus i times a real thing equal to zero. That means... Only the real things can equal zero? It means the real things can equal zero. We get two equations, two real equations. Right? Yeah. We get that the real part has to be zero, but also the imaginary part has to be zero. So it says that z, uh, you know, in other words, L of z1 has to be zero and L of z2. Oh, because you can't actually add them. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, okay. I'm with you. I'm just like, wait. So these are, yeah, these are independent. Going back to our independent subspace discussion. Which means that the real part and the imaginary part of a complex solution are separately real solutions yeah. for the problem which has been complexified. Yeah. That is why when you have e to the, you know, 2 plus minus 2 plus i t, right? That's, that's a complex solution 
This is, this is a complex solution. Rather, it's a complex value solution for the real, um, well, it, for d squared plus 4d plus 5, you know, a on z equal to 0. I'm changing the letter of the differential equation to like emphasize what's going on here, but people don't always do that. Sometimes they'll just keep the y for both and just say it's a complex solution to the real differential equation. But you got to understand that they're extending. They're complexifying and bringing it back because they're yeah. equal to zero, and therefore right. the only thing that cannot be not zero is i. But since you can't add i to any real number, mm -hmm. since, yeah, but it's a function type that be equal to zero. Right, and so this is e to the minus 2t cosine t plus i e to the minus 2t sine t. So you recognize, aha, this is my real part, which I've called z1. This is my imaginary part, which I've called z2. Now how do I bring that back into the real, real? Because i is still in there. Well, that's the thing, is that this, if I put z1 here or if I put z2 here, I get zero out, right? Mm -hmm. So these are separately real solutions to the differential equation. What's the theorem say? It says you have second order differential equation. The general solution is formed from two linearly independent solutions, right? Yeah. So you say, okay, well, e to the minus 2t cosine t, e to the minus 2t sine t, linearly independent. Therefore, y is equal to c1 e to the minus 2t cosine t plus c2 e to the minus 2t sine t is the general real solution to the problem. Now when I teach this course, I, I, I have to be careful to ask students to give me the general solution in terms of real solutions, real linear combinations of real solutions. Because there is a class of students here who will get lucky, not really understand what they're doing, but write down the following. I'll use b's this time. b1, e to the minus 2 plus i t plus b2, e to the minus 2 minus i. No, but that's not real. t, right. And they're like, that's the general solution. Well, that is the general solution. In the complex one. All right, that's the, yeah, in, in the complex case, yeah. And um, the thing is, this can actually, this will reproduce that mm -hmm. if we choose B1 and B2 in a very particular way to make this, to force this to be a real solution. Like, you can choose B1 and B2 to force this to be the real solution. But anyway, like, I want students, of course, to understand this theorem that, for the complex case, we take the complexification, we pick off the real and imaginary parts, and those separately give us real solutions. It's not directly the complex solution that solves the problem, because the problem is a real problem. Mm -hmm. And we're complexifying it Complexify. to solve it to come back. Right. And so what was the theorem you said that stated, uh, you said before the well, right here? That theorem before well that would get us from that if uh, you have a differential equation of order two, that you get two linear and independent. Oh, the existence and it's, it's the theorems we looked at last time. If we have an nth order differential equation, mm -hmm. there exists a fundamental solution set for the problem, and any solution to that problem can be written as a linear combination of that given fundamental solution set. So. As the order differential equation, there exists a fundamental solution set yeah. that what any solution to the problem can be written as a linear combination of those n fundamental solutions. The choice of the fundamental solution set, of course, is not unique. Um, but once you pick a fundamental solution set and you are given a particular solution to the problem, there is a unique choice of C1 and C2 which will reproduce that solution. Um, to see that these are linearly independent, you could shove them in the Rodskin. 
you could also see that this is clearly not a linear multiple of that, right? No. Because we know how cosine and sine are interrelated, like cosine is never zero when sine is zero. So these cannot be the same functions, they don't share the same zeros. No. Can't be a linear, like a linear multiple of one function and another will share the same zeros, right? Like rescaling doesn't move zeros. Why happens if you push it forward then? Like, you know, e to the sine t, it starts up, right? Or it starts down. One of them starts up, one of them starts down. If you were to push it over by 2 pi, no. Well, yeah, if we could, if you, sure, if we could push sine and cosine around, we could change one to the other. Yeah. Right? But as it stands, I mean, linear independence of functions, it's not hard to modify a function to get a linearly independent. So, like, a uh, function. All right, take this point and move it up here. The function with the one move point is linearly independent from the original function. You just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, linear independence of functions is, is uh, it's pretty easy to obtain, but I can't do that in the current context because like solution sets to differential equations are uh, not just any old pair of functions, it's a pair of functions which are, are married <laughs> through the structure of the differential equation and um, as we saw with Abel's formula, it's, you know, things happen. Um, so complex, the complex factor can happen, right? Yeah. Now, <clears throat> there's also the story of repeated roots, right? What about repeated roots? So you, I mean, the easiest thing to do is, I always, I mean, sometimes I try to do this, like, what if you had, like, d to the n acting on, um, you know, y equals to zero? What's that? Well, that's y prime prime prime, da -da 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 prime prime, <laughs> you know, equal to zero, n full times, right? Mm -hmm. Can you solve that? Well, I can solve that. Integrate. Integrate, integrate, integrate. Like, integrate the first time you get n minus 1 full times, right? Equal to a constant, which I'll call, um, I'll call Cn. <laughs> and then integrate again, what do you get? Oh, uh, n minus 2. n minus 2 full of these. C minus minus one. One. Yeah, Cn minus 1 plus t times Cn. Oh, we've done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sure why. And you just keep integrating. Eventually, you get y is equal to like, you know, c0 plus c1t plus c2t squared over 2. Um, c n t to the n over n times n minus 1, 3 times 2 times 1. Of course, that's an n factorial, so like. Um, I think that's what you get. The details really aren't important here. In fact, I really would have done better here too. I just talk about like d squared. Do you mind if I erase this mess? Almost done. Okay. So. Oh wait, we, we, I've, I've done this, but then you match coefficients. This should be n minus one. Yeah, but with this one, you would match coefficients or something. Whenever you're doing this. Well. I would just relabel them. I would say, well, b0 plus b1t, you know, bn t to the n minus 1. The, the point is here, 1t t squared all the way to tn minus 1. These are linearly independent. These are linearly independent solutions to the d to the n times y equals zero problem. Jenny, we can break for lunch whenever you're... Are you ready? I mean, any time is fine. Are you bringing to the problem? So, this is the fundamental, so when we have n, n fold repeats, mm -hmm. This is the solution set, right? So, 
What if we have d minus lambda to the ny equal to zero? How's that going to go? What's its fundamental solution set? What is lambda? Just a constant. I have here three, whatever. Just a number. All right, what, what, it, that shouldn't change anything because your differential operator is still going to be d to the n. Right, th this is really d minus zero to the n. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so they should, should be related in some way, right? Yeah, you should, they should still have an n minus one linear kind of parts. Yeah, they should be, well, there's n, there's n, n, n function, sorry, there's one, so there's n. Yeah. My point to you is that it shouldn't be at all surprising that the solution set to this is e to the 3t, e to the 3t, e to the n minus 1, e to the 3t, because it's just a natural like extension from just the case of integrating n full times. Of course, you can prove that these solve that by induction. You know, of course, d minus. <laughs> d minus 3 to the n power acting on e to the 3t yeah. is d minus 3 to the n minus 1 acting on d minus 3 e to the 3t, right? Is it this? Is it something to do with this? I remember that. We got so like a snack or something. Well, yeah, she's. She's here working on a system of two differentially. I mean, this is a, 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 a coupled system of first order differential equations. Mm -hmm. And she's using operator techniques to eliminate one of the variables and just reduce it to a differential equation just involving either x or y, which yeah. then we can solve by the usual method of previous chapters yeah. and then go back. So it's, it's related. Yeah. What, what, what she's doing is. She's using the technology I'm sharing with you here mm -hmm. to solve a system of differential equations. Um, Whereas right. we're using it to solve the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just explaining how the operators work to solve one. But if you look at a differential equation, if you look at a polynomial, right? If you look at p of d acting on y equal to zero, you factor that. What, what happens? How's it, how's it, how does a real polynomial factor? Well. Um, the real polynomial, I mean, it factors into how many, it, it, it had, you have how many ever zeros you have to the t power or to the whatever power of the mm -hmm. variable. And that's how many times it should cross zero. Right, but I mean, if we think about a factorization of real polynomial, we have linear factors, yeah. possibly repeated, right? Mm -hmm. And things like that, right? And then irreducible. Quadratics possibly repeated. Yeah. You have a product of linear factors possibly repeated, product of irreducible quadratics possibly repeated. That's it though. Yeah. So if you if you figure out how to solve these and figure out how to solve those, you've solved all possible cases here. So we know how to solve repeated linear factors. We yeah. just use these. What, what if we repeated a complex factor? Uh, I feel like it'd be the same song and dance, you just you get some i squareds. Yeah, like so, okay, so for example, this one. If we, if we squared this, then what would, the, what would the solution set be in that case? 